Hello, I'm Donald Leggett, and welcome to our latest London Southeast CEO interview. Our guest today is Tim Cornelius, CEO of Simec Atlantis Energy, the AIM listed sustainable energy business. Hello, Tim, welcome. Donald, good afternoon. It's lovely to have you uh, uh, on London Southeast. Thank you very much for having me. How would you describe Atlantis for those less familiar with it, Tim? <clears throat> so, Atlantis is primarily a renewable energy company, and we are split into three divisions. So think about us as a renewable energy company, which is a marine energy specialist, so tidal power, which is what we're probably best known for, um, but a company that's now diversified into multiple areas of renewables. So we also have a hydro division, which um, some of your followers may have noted during our acquisition of Green Highland Renewables last year. And of course, the most prominent part, uh, I guess, of our portfolio now, which is our sustainable or thermal division, um, which is effectively where we buy coal-fired power stations and convert them to run on a sustainable fuel. So we are a all end-to-end -end renewables company with three main divisions, marine, thermal, and hydro. Okay, let's pick up on uh, your, your start of life as a tidal stream developer, uh, your flagship energy, energy projects, Mayjan, mm -hmm. that's just off the nor uh, northeast coast of Scotland, and it's already delivering energy to the grid. So. Uh, fantastic. On behalf of Scotland, let me say you've, you've come a long way and you've, you've, you've put us on the map. Uh, you've proved that Tidal is viable. How does that make you feel? Majen is a source of immense pride uh, internally within, within our group. It's a, it's a flagship project for a number of reasons. I mean, yes, you're right. We're just you know, so, soon to surpass a, a huge milestone. I think it's going to be about 30 gigawatt hours of Tidal energy exported into the, into the grid, which which is an incredible uh, achievement in itself, technical uh, achievement. Um, <clears throat> but if you also look at uh, uh, Majen as a whole, it was one of the, the first ever tidal power projects that was brought to full financial close. It was one of the only times we've seen the UK government, the Scottish government and the Crown Estate all come together to co-fund such a large project. At the time, it was about 52, 54 million pound close. Um, in order to deliver that energy now, and that's, this is only six megawatts of installed capacity, um, giving us the, the the pathway to installing up to 400 megawatts of, uh, of capacity. It's a it's an amazing achievement. It's something we're incredibly excited about. Okay, you've you've taken me there with the next question. So how do you scale up? How do you how do you continue that pathway? Well, if you'd asked me about three weeks ago, I would have told you that um, potentially some of your followers may have been looking at uh, uh, the press releases that have been out around us seeking to develop Scotland's largest data centre, and it's going to be 100% powered by ocean energy, which on of itself is a really interesting project. And, and that's effectively to provide a route to market um, via what we call a, a private wire corporate PPA. Private wire just means that we would be running the electricity directly from the tidal array into that very large data centre, which is due to be located in the very north of Scotland in, in Caithness. Um, now, this is for about 80 megawatts. Um, and for those that don't quite understand the, uh, the technical vernacular, that's around about 40 large turbines and would be enough to, to supply many thousands of homes. Um, however, we're also now exploring new changes that the UK government are proposing. These are only proposed changes, but it could open up opportunities for us to compete very successfully in the annual auctions or the biannual auctions that are run by UK government as well. So, so two angles uh, to answer your question directly, either private wire into a large data centre or via what we call CFDs, a contracts for different scheme run by the government in an auction process next year. And what are the chances of you actually getting, a, getting a, one of those uh, government contracts, those you know, government subsidised contracts in 2021? Donald, very much dependent on whether BES, uh, who is the UK government, um, the arm responsible for running these auctions and designing them, implement some changes that would mean that we wouldn't have to compete directly with offshore wind. In the event that those changes are implemented and there's just been a public consultation completed, as, as I understand it, and we believe Majem would stand a, a very good chance. But to be clear, uh, those changes would need to be implemented and, uh, and adopted into to policy. And at, the, at this point in time, uh, it's still just a public consultation. Do you have any kind of feeling for it? I'm quite positive because I think that the unintended consequence um, of this uh, restructuring, proposed restructuring, would be the assistance of the Majen project in Tidal. I think it's designed to probably help promote floating offshore wind, mm -hmm. which is the next phase of offshore wind because we've had such huge success in the United Kingdom and, in fact, throughout Europe with the explosion and adoption of offshore wind 
really sort of supplanting, I guess, you know, the wildest expectations of, of CapEx budgets, even from an oil and gas perspective. And so to follow on from that, I think government is very excited about offshore wind, needs to give them a route to market. Uh, pot two, as we call it in the CFD auction, is that route to market. We play in that pot and currently we're competitive with floating offshore wind. So yeah, cautiously optimistic, Donald. Okay, so how much will they have to bring your cost of electricity down to be competitive with floating offshore wind? Uh, the Magen project uh, does benefit from already having a lot of its infrastructure in place. I mean, everybody that has followed the project for a period of time is aware that it's a big operating project. It has a substation, it has its grid connections, it has its underground 11 kV networks. So it's an extension project, um, which means that obviously we have lower upfront capex than a greenfield new build. So from Magen's perspective, we would deem ourselves already competitive with floating offshore wind, hence why we would fancy our chances if offered the opportunity. Okay, and what about fixed offshore wind? Are you competitive with that? No, and uh, that's, very, that's a very sort of a straightforward answer, but if you have a look at how low, unbelievably low, some of the bidding has gone into the offshore wind rounds, you know, as recently as last year, it's unrealistic to expect that a company like Atlantis could compete with A, the scale, you're talking about gigawatts, thousands and thousands of megawatts of scale. And number two, it's a cost of a battle of cost of capital. And the biggest players now are oil and gas companies, you know, and, and more so typically state owned or state backed oil and gas companies. Um, you know, whether that's uh, Equin or the old Stat Oil or uh, obviously the, uh, the old Dong Energy, um, you're talking about large balance sheeted companies with access to, to, to state debt. Uh, it would be unrealistic that we could compete pound for pound with um, uh, organisations like that. But do you think that if you actually, if the data centre in Caithness comes off, then the Scottish government and other people, the British government, might see that as a kind of a, a balancing, a, might see that as a sufficiently important project that they would, they would um, give you the nod? Absolutely. I mean, have, have a think about it. So, so Scotland, obviously, and I, I certainly don't want to get mired in politics with you, but, but Scotland is contemplating its own future. One of the key things, as we all know, underpinning growth uh, in any economy is the digital economy. Uh, Scotland needs more digital infrastructure. It needs a hyperscale data center. By the grace of God, we have uh, the Far Ice fiber optic connection, which comes in from Iceland and connects the United Kingdom to, uh, to the US via Iceland. Uh, it connects about three miles away from, from the May Gen project. Uh, and we also uh, have announced uh, that we are also, we're working on a, a second fibre optic, international fibre optic connection uh, called Celtic Norse, um, which would link Iceland and Norway to our location in Scotland. Now, <clears throat> the development of that is standalone of great importance to Scotland. To then do it, as you know, data centres are large users of energy. Um, and as you and I are sitting here today, more and more you, uh, capacity is being used every day, you know, on the likes of Zoom. And so as a result, to use a... a a, a large infrastructure project like that, but power it um, via ocean energy, which gives us the scale we need to become competitive, is a wonderful story for Scotland and a wonderful story for our industry. Okay, let's uh, stop the, the telling of the Mayjan story there. Let's turn to Sanjeev Gupta, who bought 49% of the Atlantis business in 2017, and in turn sold you a coal flower power station. Now, um, the hope is uh, to turn into, you know, it's a waste energy scheme. You're going to run it on recycled fuel pellets. Let me first of all ask, has it been that simple? It really actually has. Um, I think the, the Uskmouth project, so just, just to be clear for your, for your listeners and your viewers, you're, you're talking about the Uskmouth coal-fired power station, which is located in Newport in Wales. Um, and we acquired that as, as part of an, an RTO, a, a reverse takeover process, as you said, roughly about two years ago. Um, you know, my, my view is that uh, uh, this, is, this is one of the, the, the best trades of my professional career. We, we have a, a very misunderstood project in many respects. Um, Why is it misunderstood? I think that some people initially just uh, assumed that we were buying an old coal-fired power station and couldn't quite understand the rationale for doing so. And then some people maybe thought that it was incineration or, as you said, as you just referenced, the waste to energy project. Um, it's actually not. It's quite unique. Uh, it's unique for a number of reasons. First and foremost, uh, this is about a fuel which we've developed, um, which effectively is a direct replacement for coal. Uh, it's really important for your, you know, for, for your viewers to understand the distinction here, because what we're saying is this is not new technology. We're not sitting there saying that this is about advanced gasification or this is not pyrolysis. This is actually uh, a simple pellet, which is 50% non-recyclable material and 50% uh, what we call biogenic, which is really just paper and cardboard. And that particular pellet uh, gets milled just like standard coal. 
It gets pneumatically blown into a flame, just like standard coal was. Uh, it heats steam and therefore creates baseload power. Um, it's able to do it at a very, very low input cost. It creates a very high CV, calorific value, which means it's a very powerful pellet. Um, and it does it uh, you know, with emissions, which are well below all the European requirements. So you're making use of existing infrastructure in a location where people are used to a coal-fired power station operating. You're doing it in a much more efficient way, in a very profitable way. Um, and you're providing base load, which perversely is what's required to bring more renewables onto the grid. Uh, you know, the grid lacks inertia. So it's got a lot going for it. Tim, do you actually own these pellets though? I, you're very keen on them, but do you get the, do you have a patent on them? Do you get the, the, the prof profits from them? Donald, we don't, no, not at the moment. We, um, uh, we announced as part of our deal that we've entered into a long-term 20-year fuel supply agreement with uh, a well-established, well-known supplier of these pellets called NNP. They're a Dutch company. And they've actually formed a 50-50 JV with um, Cymec Energy, which is uh, one of the subsidiaries of the Global Energy, uh, the, the uh, GFG Alliance, which is the, the company which you referenced before, um, that take a 49% stake in, uh, in us. So no, we have a contractual relationship for supply, um, arm's length, 20 years. So what's the clever bit about ASKMA project then? What do you get out of it? It's spectacularly not clever. And I think that that is what is wonderful about it. Um, <clears throat> what we've done really is we've, 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 we've brought together, I guess, the, the burning um, combustion side, which uh, we've been in the market. We're currently undergoing significant tests, uh, the completion of tests with Mitsubishi Hitachi and at headquarters in, in Nagasaki. Uh, you know, we, we work with the incumbent um, turbine suppliers like, uh, like GE. We work with obviously the fuel experts like NNP. Uh, we upgrade the road, the rail and the port so that we're able to import that fuel. We, we work with the PPA, so we've got somewhere to sell the power. And we aggregate, aggregate all that together, bring the finance, and it should be a very, very profitable project. So all we've done is translate those skills, which we've proven in other markets like Tidal and Hydro, and we've now applied it to, uh, to a new area, which is thermal. Okay. Um, you've given me a lot of information there. When do combustion trials actually begin with Mitsubishi? They've already commenced, Donald. Okay. And are they working well? Once again, I wouldn't like to be in a position where I'm uh, providing information that could be considered price sensitive. But well, all I will tell you is that uh, trials are ongoing. Um, and we've been very, very fortunate in that we were able to get the large, very substantial amount of fuel mobilized out of uh, Europe before the lockdown with COVID. We we're able to sail across to Nagasaki and offload uh, in the port of Nagasaki during the period. And so that COVID has not impeded our testing program. Uh, and for that, we're eternally thankful. Okay. Um, you, you were mentioning a couple of weeks ago, uh, financial close was going to see a re-rating re of your share price. When do you actually expect to see that financial close on ASKMO? Once again, you can imagine there are a lot of commentators uh, and observers waiting for me to, uh, to provide a specific update as to, to when we believe financial close will be achieved. Indeed. What we did say at the beginning of COVID um, was that we would obviously be looking to, to reassess when we think that would be achievable, predicated on when we think we can get people back on site. I mean, as you're well aware, Donald, at the moment in Wales, um, you know, you still are unable to send people to a work site uh, and a construction site. We have only essential workers at the moment because we operate a live 132 kV banking station there. So um, obviously I don't have a crystal ball, same as you, um, and we're unable to specifically uh, predict when people go back to work. But, um, you know, we, what we are talking about, which I think is why, you know, we're excited about the, uh, the story as are others, it's something that is, you know, months and not years. Um, and so therefore, uh, you know, we would be anticipating, um, you know, early next year uh, being in a position to be able to, to achieve financial close and, uh, and obviously commence construction. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. So assuming it all goes well, Askmouth plant generates green electricity from 2021, which is your target that you've set for yourselves. What's the size of the market for converting coal-fired power stations to fuel pellets? Once again, I think this is why this is one of the most misunderstood projects uh, you know, in, in Europe. Um, let, let, let's just try and take some context here. Uh, all of your viewers will be aware watching any sort of mainstream media that there is virtually not a government in the Western world that's not legislating against the shutdown of coal-fired power stations. Sure. Uh, and that effectively means that you're taking a lot of base load off the grid. Um, and you're obviously trying to deepen the penetration of renewables, which is, of course, the right thing to be doing. But you do need some stability in the grid. Now, every coal-fired power station that comes offline you know, has two things, a very established operating track record and a grid connection, 
Um, but more importantly, it probably provides you know, significant grid services in that local area. Now, <clears throat> the implication here is that we are not requiring very material changes to the existing infrastructure of a, of a given coal-fired power station and that we're replacing the fuel. Um, so we're not asking to, to do a wholesale techno technological change. We're talking about changing up some fuel and, and very minor changes to milling and combustion tweaking on the actual burner system itself. So the implications are quite mind boggling when you think of every coal-fired power station, if you're an asset owner, if you're a utility, if you're an owner, would you prefer to look to decommission your site at great cost or add 20 years on it um, and potentially convert it to a, a fuel source, which is even more profitable than it, when it was operating as a coal-fired power station? So I mean, we've actually stopped hosting uh, different groups at, uh, at, at, our, at our facility in Newport because it's, it's too, too distracting for management. But, um, you know, I can tell you, and I've, I've been open in the market before, from, from China to the US, from Japan to South Korea, from Australia to Indonesia, delegations, power companies have all been coming and observing. And it's effectively, if you like, the dry well, wet well moment. You know, once the burn test results are, are announced, if they're successful from both an efficiency and emissions perspective, then all of a sudden you'll have huge interest from anyone who's trying to shut down a facility and uh, convert it to something profitable as opposed to tackle very expensive decommissioning. Who are your competitors in this market? Is it biomass producers? Um, who else is out there trying to do similar? Yeah, I don't think we necessarily have anybody that is a direct competitor for 100% conversion on this field because we're the first. That said, obviously, there are plenty of conversion um, projects uh, that, that uh, involve uh, more biomass related project uh, um, input uh, products, as you said, whether it's wood chip or, or uh, another form of, of fuel source. That said, um, and obviously at the behest here of, uh, of my engineers, who I'm sure will uh, be very keen to, uh, to clip me around the ears here. But one of the, one of the amazing things about this is that, uh, once again, the fuel has actually been tested in many other industries. It's already a, a derivation of this fuel is already co-fired. And by co-firing, it's a, it's a term which means uh, other operators in Europe use this fuel and co-fire it with coal in order to try and hit their emissions targets. So it's already been used as a fuel source, albeit that we just made it more efficient through the, the money, time and R&D we've invested in it. And second of all, it's already used as a, as a fuel substitute in, in the, uh, the cement and the steel industries. Um, so in terms of a, a product, it already has a customer base. Um, and so therefore, the competition really is going to be around controlling waste. Uh, and this is a sort of a fascinating concept now because... Uh, obviously, we're using a subset of waste, which at the moment doesn't really have a competitor. We don't compete with traditional energy from waste, which is mid-CV. We're dealing more with the stuff which is difficult to get rid of. And since China shut the gates, you can't export it. Brexit's made it more difficult to export this uh, sort of material to, to Holland or, or Poland. And, and so now you've got more material on the market, which is a good thing for us. Tim Cornelius, I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you so much for joining us. That's absolutely fascinating. I'll be perfectly frank. I need to go back and have a look at that and uh, uh, analyse what you've said myself. Uh, for more interviews like this one, please subscribe to the London South East YouTube channel. Uh, and my final thoughts, thank you for watching and stay safe.